Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we're heading down to the basement, so get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This happened back when I was 17. I'd left school that summer and had six weeks before starting college. It was baking hot in the small rural town that I lived in, situated pretty much in the middle of England. It's an old coal mining town, and a bit of British history here, all the mines were closed down, which decimated both the economy and job opportunities of the small pit towns throughout the country. Back to my town though. If you're old enough, or at least look old enough, you spend your time in the local pubs, if you don't have anything else to do but roam the streets seeking your own amusement. Me and my friends were the latter. On the main road through town away from the other houses, stood a dilapidated house known as the O'Briens. A four-story, six-bedroom mansion compared to all the others in town. There was an old couple who lived there at some point and had passed away some years prior, as, you guessed it, called the O'Briens. They had two daughters who had moved abroad and had never claimed the house, so it just sat there for years building up dust and rotting away. A perfect opportunity for somewhere cool, private and exciting for six teenagers to hang out. The house had a ridiculously big back garden, which was equally ridiculously overgrown. It literally took us the good part of a day to stomp down a pathway through the nettles and brush. Once through, there was a garage that we could drop down onto, which we pulled up the roof of to gain access. We spent nearly all summer in that house, hanging out, graffitiing the walls, drinking and smoking, but there was one room that eluded us. From the garage, you headed through a kitchen, which now only consisted of a broken window that had been boarded up, and a damaged set of cabinets on the back wall. You then stepped into a hallway which looked right through the front door, with a bathroom and two other large rooms on the left hand side. On the right were the stairs to the second floor. The staircase was built against a wall and had wooden planks running vertical. Directly opposite the kitchen door, built into the back of the staircase was a large metal door that had been painted white. The paint was now a sickly yellow dusty colour and flaky. The door was locked, it simply wouldn't budge, and looking at the hinges it opened inward. The house was big enough that we kind of forgot about the locked door. We spent most of the days up in the two rooms on the third floor, away from the road, and outside of the eyes of any passers-by that might have caught the cops on us. That was until one of the lads decided, for no apparent reasons, to light the moth-ridden curtains on fire with a zippo he was messing around with. The curtains, dust-covered carpet, and old crinkled wallpaper went up in seconds. We only made it out by smashing the top window and jumping onto a dirt mound at the side of the garage. I think if adrenaline hadn't been coursing through us, it would have been a hell of a painful fall. We hidden some bushes over the road, and watched the fire engines put the flames out. But before they got there, the house had been engulfed in flames, the second and third floor mostly. The second was still usable once we had the courage to re-enter the house, but the third was gone, just the outer walls and what was left of the roof. Shame, really. So we were confined to the bottom floor. The garage was too dark to see in, and only had an old table we found that you'd normally put the paste on wallpaper. We used to get in and out of it via the roof. The kitchen wasn't really much brighter, and the front room had a big window that overlooked the footpath and road outside, so that left us a small, bleak back room to chill in, which got boring very quickly. Boredom leads to curiosity, and I noticed that one of the wooden planks on the side of the stairs was loose, and that there was an open space behind it. Finally, we could see what was behind the metal door. What a mistake that was. They say curiosity killed the cat, but in this instance it questioned my whole belief. The wooden panels were surprisingly hard to pull off, even for six fairly athletic teenagers. So we went out scouting and brought back a few torches and a crowbar. It was a still a slog, 
but we finally managed to remove two and a half of the panels. Shining the light in the hole revealed another staircase that led downwards, yet it looked as though it was decades older than the rest of the house. Cobwebs engulfed every surface, and the stench of musk and damp attacked your nostrils whenever you got anywhere near the hole. After some giddy behaviour, some pushing and shoving, and a six-man game of rock-paper-scissors, I was the one that grabbed the torch and slowly stuck my head through the hole. The room was darker than darkness itself, so dark that the beam from the torch could be seen cutting through the blackness. I shot it down the staircase first. It went down deep. The hole we made was maybe four or five steps from the door, and there were at least 25 below it. At the bottom, a wall and a doorway to the left. I swung the torch to the right, towards the metal door, not expecting to see what I saw. The door was definitely locked tight, with three separate deadlocks that ran down the side, all barred. But what caught me by surprise was on the small lip of the top step, pushed firmly against the door, was a really outdated fridge, the ones that were squared and about waist height. I told the lads as they stood behind me and they laughed, thinking I was joking. One by one they stuck their head in the hole, checking out the bottom of the stairs and the fridge, each one as confused as myself. I remember sitting down smoking a cigarette and debating how and why it would be there. The door clearly opened inwards, which meant the door must have been locked from the inside, then somehow the fridge put against it from the inside. We spent the rest of the day checking the garage and surrounding area of the house for a trap door or another entrance slash exit to the cellar but couldn't find anything. We put it down to the sheer size of the state of the garden and went home. The next few visits to the house was us trying to decide who would enter the cellar first. No one wanted to, and no matter how many games of rock, paper, scissors we played, it always was best out of a higher number, until one day we'd had enough, or at least I had. We sat in a circle in the other room, messing with stuff and just generally chatting except me. I sat and stared at this hole, this dark void in the wall. Finally, I got up, exclaimed my intentions and took the torch from my pocket and stepped inside. Everyone else very excitedly followed behind. Immediately, the first few layers of wood steps just disintegrated under my feet. They turned into a mulch of damp splinters that clung to the sole of my shoe when I lifted my foot. It was worrying, but the stairs seemed sturdy enough. Each step I took downwards, the temperature dropped rapidly and the air seemed to be getting thicker and thicker. The inches of dust that I kicked up didn't help. I was a little scared, admittedly, but I had five other lads behind me, so it was impossible to turn tail now. I headed down and reached the last step. I could see the doorway, which led to an open room. Pausing, I regained my courage and with a few shaky deep breaths, stepped through. The room was in worse state than the stairs. Webs littered the rafters and floorboards above like moss. They hung from the ceiling in clumps, all tarnished with dust. Weirdly thinking about it now, we never saw any spiders though. The floor was carpeted in layers of debris, from rotted wood from above, dirt and dust. It was a miracle none of us ever fell through the floor above. This place was a mess. The room was huge, expanding underneath the bathroom and both rooms on the first floor and it was dark. There was no light source other than the torches three of us now carried. The room stood empty, except for a wooden table smack bang in the middle. No chairs, nothing around it, but on it stood a metal plate, crudely bashed into shape with the remnants of black goo on it. Next to the plate stood a tall uncorked green bottle. One of the boys went over to pick it up. It sloshed, as he did so, with a liquid of deep brown and layers of dirt inside. I never smelled it, but apparently it was putrid. At first, we didn't see the other doorway. It was in the corner, directly opposite the one we had entered. No door, 
just total darkness. We tried to shine our torches through it, but they didn't seem to cut through the shadows. It was like there was actually a door there, one that drained the torchlight. For some reason I didn't muster the courage to go into that room, and neither did anyone else. We simply turned and left, feeling like we'd had enough adventure for the day. Over the next week or so, we invited girls and other friends to the house, but they all refused to enter the basement. We found this hilarious, and would dare one another, more to show off than anything, to go down there, either on our own or in pairs, without a flashlight, and see how long we would stay down. Now, not once did I get scared while I stood in the complete darkness down there. It was kind of calming, but none of us ever had the courage to enter the other room. In hindsight, we should have questioned more why the door was metal, or why it was locked from the inside, and how a fridge got up the stairs and placed in front of the door as a barrier from the inside also. But full of excitement and immaturity, it never crossed our minds. We just assumed there would be some sort of other exit in the other room that led to the garden. Word quickly went through the year groups about the O'Brien basement, and we definitely fed the rumours of it being haunted. Teenagers would ask us how to get into the house, and to show us the barricaded door and basement. So, because we thought we were cool, we spent another day making a maze in the garden, squashing pathways down that led away from the garage. We would then invite people into the house, lead them through the garden, into the garage, and show them the hole in the stairs. It got quite popular, and we decided to cash in on the opportunity. We told people that if they wanted to see the basement, they would have to do the initiation. As they came in, we would have one person sat on the fridge, and another at the bottom of the stairs, both with torches to send people into the first room, telling them that they had to stay in there for ten minutes with the torches turned off, and we would then let them out. This went on for a while, and it was fun at first. A lot of people bottled it as soon as the torches were turned off, but some stayed. We cheered them back up the stairs when they completed it. It was a cheesy little ritual we created, but still, everyone refused to go into the other room. When questioned, they just said they didn't feel comfortable, until my little brother came with his friends. They were two years younger than us, and initially we refused to let anyone who wasn't our age into the house. We were there all the time, and there were six of us in the friend group, so it was pretty easy to deter people if they were managing to find the entrance at the garage. But after constant pestering, and the initial curiosity of others, we decided to invite them along. We made a big deal out of it, taking them to the dilapidated fence at the back of the garden, and tying their jumpers around their faces as we led them blind through the maze of shrubbery and thorns to the garage. It was a decent drop from the hole in the roof, and even though my brothers managed it, his friend had to be lowered down by his arms. Once inside, they were met with the stench of smoke that lingered from the floors above. We walked them through the kitchen, showed them the makeshift entrance to the basement, and told them the story of the metal door, and how it didn't make sense, and gave them the option of staying in the first room in the pitch darkness for ten minutes, or go to the second room in the pitch black for five, an offer a lot of people initially picked, until they made it down. Second room, they said in unison. We all laughed, expecting them to change their minds immediately. One of the lads slipped through the hole in the wooden board and turned right, heading up the stairs and positioning himself on the fridge. I went through next and positioned myself at the foot of the stairs. I'd just like to say at this point, all of us regulars felt completely comfortable going down to the bottom of the stairs alone. We'd all taken it in turns when bringing people down there, and had done it numerous times each. This time was no different. There was a giddy, nervous atmosphere when two of the younger ones entered the staircase. The torches we used were cheap ones we'd gotten from the market, so they cast an eerie yellow glow. Slowly, my brother and his friend made it down the stairs, clearly attempting to show face and act unmoved by the state of the rotten decaying wood around them. But as they trenched through the mulch, they stuck close together. They took their time, so much so the guy at the top shouted for them to hurry, and both nearly crapped their pants. When they finally got to me, 
I told them this was the first room, shining the torch around the room through the doorway, and that they were to go into the next one, aiming my beam through the darkness to the frame of the other door. The room was a decent size, and as stated the torches were cheap, but I remember taking notice that the beam that cut through the first room never seemed to illuminate the second room at all, as if there was an object obstructing the path. My brother's friend walked into the room, and as my brother walked past me I grabbed his shoulder and told him that he didn't have to do this, and if he did he could come back out whenever. With a nod, as a dismissive wave, he followed his friend. They crossed the room past the table and disappeared through the second doorway, as if walking through a dark stage curtain. I hit the button on my Casio watch and started the countdown from five minutes. I then aimed the beam of light up the staircase. The guy sitting on the fridge smiled excitedly and looked at his watch. I really need a piss dude, I'll be right back, he said, jumping down and disappearing through the gap. I stood at the bottom of those steps for what seemed like forever. I could hear the faint giggles from across the first room. They seemed muffled, as if hearing voices from behind the door. How long left? My brother's voice shouted. Three and a half minutes. Now in the basement, despite it obviously being underground, there was never an uncomfortable temperature. It was colder than upstairs, but had no bite. There was never a chill, and while being down there countless times, not once had any of us ever felt any sort of breeze. And this memory still haunts me a little, especially when there is a sudden shift in temperature. I noticed that I became very cold and stood at the bottom of the stairs to the point I could see my breath when checking the time against the light on my watch face. The mumble from the other room had stopped also. I tried to focus on them, see if I could hear any movement or the nervous noise they had been making before but nothing. I remember getting freaked out. I don't know what about, but I could feel my heart beating faster, the hairs on my arms and on the back of my neck stood on end. I turned on the torch and stepped into the first room. You guys alright? I called out, but there was no reply. Stop messing around. I shone the torch through the doorway of the second room, but just like before, it was as if the beam cut through the first room and stopped at the doorway. I crept closer, calling my brother's name, but he never replied. Then, as clear as day, so loud it hurt my ears after the silence, a voice, deep, brash and distorted, shouted out, leave now. I froze on the spot, eyes fixated on the doorway. Then emerging from the gloom ran my brother and his friend, both as white as snow, both with tears and snot streaming down their faces. The look of pure terror on their faces is something I have never been able to bleach from my mind. They bolted straight past me, which snapped me out of my trance and I followed suit. Before we could reach the doorway to the stairs, the sound of crashing came from the stairwell. Four ridiculously loud bangs and the noise of snapping wood. The fridge was embedded in the wall at the bottom of the staircase. Without stopping, we scrambled over it. The staircase itself was a complete mess. Large splinters of wood stuck up like spikes. Luckily, and I don't know how, we managed to clamber up on our hands and feet without injury. Halfway up, I looked towards the hole in the wall, praying it would be in reaching distance, and both the young lads were in front of me, both sobbing and screaming. Both ran straight past the hole in the wall. The metal door, locked before and with no key, we looked everywhere for it, stood open. Light from the garage exit spilled through the kitchen and down into the basement, as if it showed us the quickest way out. Instinct had set in at this point, and all three of us started through the door, onto the table, and up through the garage. My brother's friend, too small to get down on his own, managed to get out without help. We ran through the garden maze. At some point I had to grab hold of my brother to stop him from going down one of the many dead ends we had created, and without word took the lead. We raced to the fence, squeezed through the hole, and collapsed on the field behind the property. I looked around. And there, also sat on the grass, staring at the three of us, was everyone else who had been in the house. No one said a word. 
Everyone looked as scared as each other, except for the two younger boys. They wept for a long time, actually, as we all just sat there in silence and let them do it. Once they had stopped, we all got up without a word and went home. My brother said nothing to me on the way, or when we got back. He went into his room, and I went into mine, and that was the end of that. No one went into the house again. It stood for a year or two and was then demolished. Apparently, one of the daughters had finally come over to claim the land, only to sell it for some new build project. Now a group of houses sit where the garden and house were. Nice looking houses, to be fair. My brother still refuses to walk past that estate. They never built on the land directly above the cellar. Apparently, and I've never actually had this confirmed, but the builders refused to fill the cellar in for some reason, just bricked it up and left it as an open space despite being able to fit a perfectly good house on there. We only brought it up once with the friend group, and only because I convinced myself that it had been them that had opened the door somehow and moved the fridge, but they all swore that it wasn't. They said as soon as it started getting really cold in the house they got spooked. They heard the voice and headed for the kitchen, noticed the door was open, and they heard the loud bangs and bolted. I tried asking my brother about the room, but he completely shut down when I did. He quickly stopped being friends with the kid who went down with him, said they no longer had anything relevant to talk about. I'm left with a deep sense of curiosity as to what the hell was down there, what it wanted, and why it was locked in. Questions I'll never have the answers to, and perhaps it's better this way. About a decade back, I used to work at a brewery slash pub. It was a pretty big and old building from the early 1900s. I worked there for a few years, and most of the time it was pretty chill, but at times backbreaking. On my time working there, I had two experiences that I can only describe as supernatural. The first one was a particular night, and I was tasked with closing up the hangar slash loading docks. Closing it up was making sure there weren't any obstructions where the trucks would park, stacking up loose crates, and turning the lights off and locking up. I was about done, so I turn off the lights as I'm making my way to the door, and a beer bottle comes rolling towards me from the darkness between the tall stacks of crates. It wasn't forceful or anything. It looked like someone gently placed it on the floor and rolled it towards me. I didn't think much of it, so I picked up the bottle and placed it inside a half-empty crate. I turned around, and I started walking when another bottle comes rolling from the same place, then another. Tired and thinking it was a co-worker trying to mess with me, I shout, Hey, you're right, you got me. Come on, I gotta close up. I expected to hear laughter or something, but there was just dead silence. I waited a few minutes, turned on my flashlight, and started looking around the stacks of crates for what I thought would be a giggling co-worker. After searching each corner, I turn and give up. I was a little weirded out at this point, but I just picked up the two bottles from the ground, placed them in the same crate as the first one, turned off my flashlight and shouted into the darkness, Alright, I'm locking up. See you tomorrow. Just as I finished saying that, a crate full of bottles fell from one of the stacks and landed two feet from me. Glass shards and beer exploded everywhere. The next day I told my boss about it, and he said it was probably a rat. The thing is, those crates, when full, probably weigh 20 pounds. How could a rat push it? Talking to my co-workers, they told me they've experienced weird stuff during closing. My second experience happened again when I was closing the pub. When closing, the last thing you usually do is restock the walk-in freezer. The freezer is probably just as cold as the building itself and sits underground right beneath the bar. I was down there, filling that enormous thing with kegs and crates. Being a very old freezer from the time when safety wasn't a big concern, the thing doesn't open from the inside. No handle, nothing. Just a flat, plain steel door. So I did what I always do when I have to go inside that thing. I put a keg securing the door open. I was halfway through the task when I hear the door slam shut. I run towards the door, but it's locked shut. I started pounding on it, but the only other person there was my boss in the office two floors above me, 
probably with his door closed. I had tried my phone, but since I'm locked underground inside a steel box, I had no cell phone service. I was wearing only jeans and a t-shirt, so things were getting chilly pretty quickly. My face was going numb, and my hands were getting stiff. I made a blanket out of cardboard, but it was doing very little from keeping the cold at bay. The only reason I didn't freeze to death was because I had a date with a regular, and she went there looking for me. She asked my boss where I was, and when he couldn't find me, he went to the basement and found me inside the freezer. I was there for 45 minutes when he found me, and I was starting to consider writing a letter to my parents and drinking myself to sleep. My boss installed a chain to keep the door after that, but I refused to ever go back into the walk-in freezer after that. The weirdest part, the keg I had holding the door open, was on the other side of the room when I got out. It was a full steel keg, not something that just slides away quietly. I stopped working there shortly after for unrelated reasons. This all started when I was around 13. It began with footsteps that were heard by my stepdad, my mum and sister. That's when we were all sitting in the living room. It had done numerous things over the years. The spirit turned on blenders, turned on lights, turned on water faucets, lots of footsteps and moving things around. There were lots of witnesses to many of these events. It quieted down over the years. About a year ago, there was a flurry of activity over a few weeks, witnessed by my wife and my mum who was visiting. There hadn't been anything I noticed until last night. Earlier this year, I did an organisation of the house. We have two kids of nine and seven, and we went through all their toys and asked them if they wanted to save or donate anything. All the toys they wanted to keep, to give to their kids someday, I put in a plastic Ziploc bag and into a tote, and I put that in the top shelf of the basement. I went downstairs last night, and a set of baby keys were laying on the basement floor. What I mean by baby keys are plastic keys you give to babies for them to chew or play on. They are bright colours, about six to eight of them, and I specifically remember my daughter telling me she wanted to keep them, and I put it in one of the bags. Now the bags are on the top shelf. My kids are little and physically incapable of taking down, let alone pulling the totes back up. They also will not go downstairs by themselves because they're scared of ghosts. Also note, I took Christmas decorations up from the basement a few weeks ago and put the plastic totes back. There were no keys on the floor. Also, note, my wife has not messed with any of the stuff in the basement as she leaves it to me to take stuff up or down. So they were there, on the basement floor. When I saw them, I said out loud, that's unusual. They're still there. I haven't put them back yet. It's not earth shattering, but it's unusual. And I wonder how they got there and if there's some strange phenomena behind its sudden appearance. I used to work at this rink for five years. I started off as a skate monitor, to a cashier, to hockey coach and so on. Shifts would vary from around 6am to the earliest, to 1-2am to 2 the latest, working maintenance when needed. There were always stories about the rink being haunted, starting off with the most famous story about this Zamboni driver named Bry, who would always open around 5-6am to 6 to prep the ice for the day. The story goes that Bry opened up the rink and started cutting the ice when he saw a little girl standing on it. Bree began to yell to the girl to get off the ice when she vanished into thin air. Bree promptly called his supervisor Carl, who I worked for, and quit on the spot. Now though I worked the five years at the rink, I have felt, seen and heard countless amounts of stuff. I've seen shadows bolt around the rink. People call out my name when I'm the only one in the whole building, and an uneasy feeling while doing maintenance. But, the scariest moment of all was when I was printing jerseys in what we call the dungeon, which is just the basement. It was creepy and outdated, and with only one light source, and tunnels that are partially covered that lead all under Stamford. For some old reason, we had a witch doll on the wall, 
and as soon as you enter the dungeon you see it. No one knows who put it there, but one night as I was printing jerseys for summer camp the next morning, for some odd reason the lights went out. As I pulled out my phone to turn on the flashlight, I was walking to the only set of stairs that led to the Zamboni Bay. I heard a child whisper coming from the room I was in. As you can imagine, after hearing that, I ran, and when I saw my co-workers, I started to cry. Thankfully, I left, and have been gone about four years now. I don't think I will ever go back. I was a toddler, no more than three years old when my family and I lived in a small rented house in Vermont. There are a few things I remember about it. A spiral staircase, a large field, the cold cement floor on my bedroom, and a part of the house that I was strangely drawn to, the basement. I was, and still am, a wanderer. I also don't mind being alone. Both of these qualities made the basement a sort of getaway. I wasn't allowed down there by myself, but a handful of times, I was able to sneak my way down there. I remember crawling down the stairs like they were a ladder, being overly cautious of falling, as I had done before. Sometimes I would hear mumbling coming from somewhere in the basement, but it was too quiet for anything to be discernible. When I got to the last step, and turned around, I would see her over in the corner, a mannequin with blonde hair and an expressionless face. All I would think is that she looked like the mannequin in J.C. Penney's or Kmart. I never once thought it was odd that she was there. Some basements have exercise equipment, we have a mannequin. Years later, and living in a different home, I decided to bring this up with my mum. Why would we have a store mannequin in our basement? My mother just gave me a strange look and laughed and said, We never once had a mannequin in any place where we lived. To this day, I still have no idea what it was that I saw in the basement. I have been a paranormal investigator for more than a year, and my investigations have been quite interesting to say the least. There was this one time we were investigating in an abandoned Greek hospital in Athens, and near the end, we decided to split up and investigate by ourselves. But one of the three members would go to the basement by himself, and I was the lucky one. I only took the voice recorder and the EMF while the others got the spirit box and thermal cameras. In the basement, things started off relatively slow. No spikes on the EMF, no voices captured on the recorder, and the atmosphere was good. Everything changed when I started being a little bit more provoking. I knew I shouldn't do it, but I thought it was the only way I would capture something. To be honest, I really was running my mouth and saying things I shouldn't. At some point, the EMF spiked all the way to the end, and then it stopped and went back to normal. That's when I left. Going home at around 4.30, I decided to start analysing the footage of our video cameras. We had some EMF spikes when we were investigating altogether, and some weird voices from the spirit box and a weird figure on one thermal camera. I left my EVP session at the end, because I thought it was uneventful. I put my headphones on, and started listening for the 25 minute EVP session. The first 18 minutes were boring, and then, near the 22 minute mark, I had already started provoking quite a bit. That's when I heard a voice say, Don't speak. Stay quiet. And the funny slash weird thing was that a minute earlier, the EMF had spiked red. Do you think it's a coincidence? The whole time I was in the basement, I had a huge headache. I wonder if the spirits were playing with me. And just for those interested, this whole thing happened in Greek. But is written in English for your convenience. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I was adopted into my current family about five years ago, that being February 2017. My family had a nice house where my siblings and I all had our own rooms. There was also a basement, which at the time was a game room for all of us and was the biggest room in the house. Eventually, my two older brothers moved out during the second year of me living there. 
when they did, my sister and I decided to switch rooms. I got her room, and she got the basement room. During those two-ish years, my sister complained about numerous nightmares and claimed to have seen dark shadows at night, as well as hearing the boiler room and storage room door open. Me and my parents would just laugh at the claims and would say that it was because of how late she would stay up and all the energy drinks she consumed. I wish I hadn't have laughed. In December of 2021, my sister moved out due to her graduating early and my parents renovated the basement room where I then moved into. I was excited to have my own space downstairs. It was about the size of a smaller studio apartment with enough closet space and a bathroom with a walk-in shower. On my first night in the basement, it was so messy due to everyone moving everything downstairs. So I stayed up past midnight, organizing everything, just wanting to get it done. When I heard the basement door open, I thought it was my mum. So I naturally joked around and said, isn't it past your bedtime? I opened the bedroom door and looked up the stairs to see the door just wide open. I was kind of confused, but shook it off and closed it. I went back downstairs and closed the bedroom door. I eventually finished and just went to bed. In the morning, I asked my mum if she went down there during the night and she denied it. She claimed it was just me being tired, so I shook it off. I didn't experience anything for a few days. I came home from school one evening. I was home alone and came home to all the basement doors open as well as the door to the basement. We have cats that weren't allowed downstairs, so I worry they may have gotten into my things. My mum never forgets to close the door because of that, so I immediately thought that someone may have broken in. But our front and back doors were all locked still, and I had come in through the garage. I ran down to check and saw our cat in the boiler room. She was in the far corner and I heard something hiss at her. I swear on my biological parents that the boiler room swung closed. It's hard to shut due to the wood door frame being somewhat uneven. That's what confused me. Me trying to be brave, I went into the corner, grabbed my cat. I opened the door and shut the remaining doors and went back upstairs. And I found my mum just coming home. What are you doing with the cat? She asked. Did you leave a bunch of doors open? No, haven't been here since 8am and haven't needed to go down, why? I told her about what happened and she mentioned how maybe my brother stopped by and pulled a prank on me, but neither of us could explain the door swinging closed. That night I couldn't fall asleep. I began to get all paranoid and started to overthink the situation from earlier. Then it hit me. I remember the things my sister complained about when she lived in the basement. The next morning, I brought it up with my mum, and she looked somewhat concerned. She never believed in the paranormal stuff, but I did. I'm pretty sure this convinced her. After this, it kept happening. The boiler room door would be mostly open, but from time to time, my bedroom door and storage room door would be open. Lights going crazy on and off happened a few times as well. I had my one and only incident of sleep paralysis where I thought I saw a tall shadow in the bathroom doorway, and I decided to ask for help. My friend's mum was a medium, and I asked her if she could come and have a look and step into the basement to see. One night, she agreed to come over. It was back in April. She said she was drawn to the boiler room immediately. She claimed the energy was dark in the boiler room, specifically, and that it was some kind of spirit and perhaps an entity that was trying to find peace and was just angry. She suggested we get the house blessed by a professional. My mum and I appreciated the help and she left. My parents knew the house's history and were all confused. To this day, the events still occur, despite being blessed twice, but the activity has slowed down. I honestly believe that my sister's collectible antiques may have got something attached to the house, but I'm not sure. She had a few creepy clown dolls and old frames for aesthetic purposes back in high school. But then again, they're not in our home anymore. If anyone has any tips, I'd be keen to hear them. As a kid, my parents converted half of our garage into a room for me, so that I didn't have to share a bedroom. But right as I moved in there, 
there would be these fast crawling noises that would run along my walls. It would keep me up for hours through the night. It would be loud scratching noises and fast running through every wall in the room. I told my parents and they had an exterminator come and see if any animals got in there somehow. The guy said there was absolutely nothing. No signs of anything that could be making the noise. My parents called me crazy and said I wasted their time. The night the exterminator came, I woke up to a loud bang on my wall. When I woke up, there was something in the corner of my room watching me. I went under the covers and tried not to acknowledge it until I passed out, and didn't even bother telling my parents about it. I didn't actually sleep in the garage after that, and I switched rooms permanently about a month after. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed tonight's stories, please be sure to let me know down below. A huge thanks, as always, to my members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen. Your support is very much appreciated, so thank you all. Finally, if there are any stories you wish to share, you can find the links in the description. But that's it for now. There are more links on screen if you want to watch more. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.